Well, Martin, thank you so much. I'm really very happy uh, for that we have just signed a memorandum of understanding between our two organizations and uh, IPU and OHCHR. And um, I think that our organizations have made quite some progress. Uh, do you think so? Yes, I, I thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate this opportunity and welcome to the House of Parliaments. And uh, I think that we've gone a long way in our relationship with the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And uh, I have seen uh, that there has been uh, the entrenchment of the role of parliaments in the work that your office does. And uh, especially when it comes to the treaty bodies, uh, we have seen strong involvement of parliaments in the UPR process. And earlier we were talking about uh, the uh, 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 Forum on Democracy and Human Rights. Uh, I was pleased to chair this a, a couple of years ago, and I think that, uh, in fact, the work that we're also doing in terms of building capacity in various countries, I think at the end of this month, you and I are going to be hosting this workshop on pa parliaments and the COVID and yes. human rights. Yes. So I think that uh, the, a lot has been done. For me, uh, the only possibility uh, on really ensuring a democracy who's strong is that it's based on human rights, but on the other hand, they both interact in a very important way. So the, the parliaments who are uh, committed to human rights and that are, have a relationship with all the different uh, mechanisms of the UN human rights system is essential. It's essential, uh, for example, when we're talking about the UPR because parliaments can have their own participation. You can also have, if governments are open enough, delegations that are, if I would say, pluralistic and represent different points of view and they can sort of share a different perspective and not only one monolithic view of the country. But also because I think parliaments are more aware of the importance of human rights, can create their own uh, commissions inside parliaments and can be more, can be champions of human rights. So I think the relationship with all the mechanisms, being it treaty bodies or special rapporteurs, or, or, or any, any kind, well, and the Human Rights Council as well. I think it helps member states to understand better parliament, but also parliamentarians to understand better the importance of human rights and, and the situation of their, of, of their governments, and then to come back home mm -hmm. and ask them to improve the situation at home. Yeah, that's, that's quite <laughs> interesting. Uh, and that's what we have been uh, you know, advocating for, for years, that the parliament should be more involved in these uh, human rights uh, mechanisms because they are the greatest allies yeah. when they go back home in terms of the legislative framework and uh, holding government accountable. And so we're very pleased to see that increasingly parliamentarians are coming to the Human Rights Council and some of them are spearheading their country reports on the, uh, the UPR. But I'd like to take you to something about the uh, technology. You and I were talking about uh, the use of technology now in do, uh, improving the way we do business. But how do you see this impacting on human rights and democracy as a whole, the technological progress and innovation? Well, first of all, I think technology has come to stay. And we were talking about that, that we cannot imagine our organizations working as before, mm -hmm. because there's so much that can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and, and it could be good because I see in the Human Rights Council, for example, more civil society participates than before. It could be the ones who could have buy tickets and could stay in Geneva. That is not very, <laughs> yeah, it's not a very cheap city for people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think technology could be a fantastic possibility of expanding democracy, mm -hmm. of expanding participation, of, of, but we have problems. We have problems because almost 50 percent of the population don't have access to online mm -hmm. and we see in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, context that how many children could not could not go to school could be, I, I mean by, by by digital ways because they didn't have access uh, mm -hmm. to online uh, platforms secondly I would say the other thing we have seen is in some countries using COVID-19 as a pretext they have been trying to restrict civic space, mm -hmm. freedom of, uh, of expression, freedom of press. Mm -hmm. uh, they have blockaded internet and, and did that kind of things, you know, saying that these are security issues or special measures because of the pandemic. Uh, and, and the other problem that we have seen in some part of the world as well is the use of technology to surveillance of 
yes. human rights defenders or civil society leaders or parliamentarians even though. Mm -hmm. huh? So I think technology is not good or bad. Technology can be good or bad, but it has to be uh, the the technology for good uh, to, to provide all these opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of medi medicine and many other things, mm -hmm. uh, so important where we can get. Huh? Yeah. But it has some issues, and that's why we have been working with the industries uh, in terms of saying, look, when you are going to develop a, a new platform or a new application, mm -hmm. You don't need to develop it and then see if it will violate human rights. From the beginning, in the design, you have to include the human rights approach because yeah. otherwise, what if that technology comes in the wrong hands yeah. and is used in a, in a terrible way? But yeah. I believe that technology is important yeah. uh, and we need to sort of create certain regulations because today the industries are doing it by themselves through their ethics office. But mm. ethics office can change. I yeah. think one thing in one place, something in another. Mm -hmm. So I think we need certain regulation or a smart mix of measures yeah. that it means some voluntarily do things and some maybe we need to regulate. That's correct. I think I agree uh, with you, Michelle, because uh, uh, there are these ethical and moral uh, considerations that have to be put on the table. And uh, yeah, there could be some voluntary uh, monitoring and regulation, but you need some oversight and uh, I would offer that parliaments are going to have to make sure that that oversight framework is in place so that uh, the rights of individuals are not unduly impacted by uh, uh, these uh, technological trends and yeah. we have just created a working group on science and technology here mm -hmm. to address these uh, ethical challenges yeah. and uh, to make sure that uh, whatever is happening in the area of science and technology should be beneficial to mankind uh, in a way that is very clear and should not be restrictive of their freedoms and all of that. So I, I, I agree with that. But uh, if we could go back to the role of Parliament, I, can I take it that you, both of us are committed to continuing to strengthen Parliament's capacity? Because uh, you know we take for granted that all Parliaments are able to uh, uh, promote and protect human rights, but that's not the case. There are some that are still struggling. I think we mentioned a couple of them ago in our private conversation, uh, but then how can we then uh, build that capacity, make sure that human rights are mainstreamed into parliamentary processes? Well, I, I, I mean, in my experience from my country, because we had a dictatorship and a huge history of uh, violation of human rights, parliaments, when we restored democracy, very quickly created a commission of human rights because there was a lot of appetite for something. Mm -hmm. Because there was a process in the country trying to advance on truth, reconciliation, and reparation. Mm -hmm. So parliament was part of that as well. But I think that not every country sometimes are even aware of the situations that can happen in the country. And sometimes it's not, it, it, it is not necessarily a problem with the political space, but it could be discrimination. For example, one thing we have seen in COVID-19 is that the most impacted are the most marginalized, uh, the mm. most vulnerable. And not because they are inherently more vulnerable, it's because mm. they have been discriminated, excluded for so long. Mm. So I think parliaments should also, could, even if they put in the name human rights or not, um, for example, in the COVID response, now and in the recovery, they could, for example, try to identify which are those groups, ethnic groups or women and children, older people, people living with disabilities, indigenous people, LGBTQ plus community, um, people, uh, migrants and refugees and IDPs, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. All those people, we know they are disproportionately impacted. Of mm -hmm. course, minorities, and we have yeah, seen yeah, it yeah. in the US, Afro descent, Latinos, in other places, Asian groups. And mm -hmm. So, I mean, even in the COVID-19, we can have this approach to identify who is being left behind, okay. and if you don't develop particular policies, mm -hmm. they're gonna be left behind even further. Mm -hmm. But we can also, I think, through different activities from your organization, from my organization, uh, all over the world, in different places, we can work with parliaments to mm -hmm. try to convince them of the importance of human rights, mm -hmm. try to mm -hmm. support them also in the discussion on the relationship between human rights and 
the SDGs and the Agenda 2030, for example. Yeah, that's yeah. very important. It's yeah, one of our, of our focus on the cooperation. That's yeah? right. That's yeah. right. I think it's important. Uh, and uh, uh, I have been telling my uh, people who come to see me here that uh, it's high time we took the human being back into the center of global governance. Yes. Because we tend to speak in abstract terms, yes. right? Uh, even when we talk about human rights, it's like it's there. It's a value, it's a principle and all like. But we're not putting enough of a human face to <laughs> human rights. And I think that uh, you and I in our uh, respective organizations can work to make sure that that happens. And the SDGs, I would think, are a good blueprint for us to bring the human being back to the uh, global conversation.